Good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see so many friends of CSIS and friends of UNICEF together with us today. And I hope you've all enjoyed a meal, and this is meant to be a very informal and open conversation. So as we get started, please feel free to go back and forth and grab some dessert, grab some uh, tea and coffee as you need it. It's really a great honor for us to have with us today Dr. Anthony Lake, uh, who, as you all know, assumed his position as the sixth executive director of UNICEF last May. I believe this is, Dr. Lake, your first visit to Washington in your new capacity, and we're really quite honored that you're with us, close to your first visit, if it's not actually your first visit. Visiting my wife. Okay. So in your official new capacity, it's your, your, first, your first visit, but we're, we're very honored that you've chosen to join us here at CSIS today to talk about your vision moving, moving forward. Um, I bring you greetings from, uh, from John Hamry, our president and CEO, who unfortunately is in Japan, or else he would be here with us as well um, to welcome you. Uh, you know, I think there's no doubt that the multilateral institutions are playing an increasingly central role in managing some of the great global challenges of our, of our time, and that's a set of issues that here at CSIS we're looking at all the more carefully. Within our Global Health Policy Center, we have a stream of work now we're developing on looking at the different multilaterals that work in the health area, thinking about how the U.S. can best maximize its engagement with those organizations. Other parts of our institution are going down a similar path. We've had a um, series in conjunction with the University of Miami over the last year or so um, looking at the great global challenges of our time with a particular focus on the MDGs and what's going to be required to make greater progress there. And it's an area of our work we're hoping to expand. We're bringing some additional expertise into CSIS. Um, Mark Quarterman from the Secretary General's Office has recently joined us, and we look forward to working with him on these, on these issues as well. Um, there's certainly been a time of great challenge for UNICEF and for anyone that cares about child health. Uh, in the time since you've been um, in office, Dr. Lake, you've not only been responding to the continuing challenges of rebuilding in Haiti, but also the emergency response to the floods in Pakistan. And I think most uh, fundamentally the opportunities to look at last month's MDG summit and think about how do we really leverage that event and all the activity and energy around it to ensure a greater, deeper, and more successful focus on the MDG goals. So it's really very timely that you're here with us today to speak about UNICEF's new vision, uh, which challenges the conventional wisdom by suggesting that an equity approach, approach which focuses on the poorest, the most disadvantaged, and the hardest to reach children will in fact be the most cost-effective and practical means of achieving progress on the MDGs by 2015. Um, the report, which is entitled Narrowing Gaps to Meet the Goals, as well as its companion piece, Achieving the MDGs with Equity, is, is all at your, your places for you to look at as we chat a bit um, this afternoon. Uh, I think probably everyone in this room would agree that there's great energy and momentum and excitement around the new levels of com political commitment that are being directed to maternal and child health. I mean, we've seen this through the work of the G8, the Muskoka Initiative, the Secretary General's new initiative on maternal child health, commitments that are being made by bilateral donors. Certainly the MCH agenda is a very important part of the U.S. Global Health Initiative. Norway continues its strong leadership. But there are also some very fundamental challenges, and I certainly sense a concern that we're really going to be able to capitalize on all the political energy and make sure that that really does work, result in some concrete achievements um, this time around, and that we tackle in a more meaningful way some of the really deeply ingrained challenges that have prevented progress in the past, you know, particularly issues around health systems, issues around neonatal mortality, issues around building a greater base of community health workers who can actually help address some of the real needs within families. So we're very much looking forward to hearing more about UNICEF's strategy and how UNICEF intends to tackle those critical problems moving ahead. So thank you very much for joining us. Oh, before I... Um, Give the floor to Dr. Lake. Let me just introduce for a second also other two senior UNICEF staff members who are here with us on the podium this afternoon, Dr. Mickey Chokra, who is the Chief of Health and Associate Director of Programs 
Before joining UNICEF in 2009, Dr. Chopra was with the South African Medical Research Council, and he's going to do a short presentation following Dr. Lake's remarks. And Dr. Rudy Nippenberg, who is the Principal Global Health Advisor on Health Systems, Strategies, and Policies, and who's been with UNICEF in a variety of positions for more than 20 years. So um, welcome to you both. Please, uh, Dr. Lake. Uh, thank you very much, Lisa, and, and uh, thank you, Steve, for hosting this. I'm very, very glad to be at CSIS, where I've uh, done other projects, and uh, just have enormous respect for all you're doing and all you will do on this issue. I know, I know that's a commitment. You just nodded. Yes, that's good. We will. Okay. <laughs> um, and you were anyway. I know. Uh, let me first note that I that Mickey is a real doctor, uh, and I am not. But thank you. Um, let me just give you a very brief introduction to this, uh, more or less historically, though it goes back all of five months, uh, uh, and begin by emphasizing this is not a new UNICEF strategy. Uh, UNICEF has always been uh, fundamentally concerned with issues of equity in the most disadvantaged children. Uh, but uh, as we thought about this uh, last spring uh, and looked at statistics, not only from UNICEF, but from Save the Children and many others, uh, the fact is that as the world has been making progress towards the MDGs, mostly by averaging national statistics, uh, we are discovering that in a lot of countries, and we'll show you this in more detail, while the nations might be making uh, some progress on under five child mortality, the, it's very uneven, and within nations and among nations, the gaps between the most disadvantaged and the most advantaged are growing. So uh, I arrived at UNICEF to discover that people at UNICEF shared an equal passion for refocusing UNICEF's work uh, for uh, those children, uh, whether they are children living in indigenous areas, children living with disabilities, uh, whatever, they are uh, reason enough uh, in principle as they are being left behind to make us angry and make us refocus on them. So from the start, we've been talking about a new uh, refocusing of UNICEF's efforts uh, into those areas. And I'm uh, very happy that our executive board uh, and just our national committees and everybody has been very supportive of this strategy. But we also uh, decided to uh, examine uh, another question. And that was, and uh, Mickey will be speaking about this uh, more analytically and at somewhat greater length, but the questions we posed to ourselves uh, was this. Isn't it possible that because the needs are greatest in these areas, that the same interventions in these areas would produce greater results in terms of children's lives saved than intervening in areas that are easier to reach, but where the results are less because the needs are less? So the analytical question was, it, yes, the conventional wisdom is uh, that it's more expensive and it is and more difficult to get into these areas. The question is, are the results of concentrating on these areas greater than any additional costs to get there? In other words, is it cost effective to work there? Because if it's cost effective, that means that we can, at a time of limited resources around the world, move more quickly towards the MDGs which is a statistical goal, and save all of those children's lives, which is the real goal. So we are proceeding on that. Uh, Mickey and Rudy began then uh, an exhaustive study, which Mickey will uh, uh, describe, uh, in which we got a team of our best analysts uh, to work on this question in terms of under five mortality. Uh, they studied it for months, very rigorously, brought in uh, experts from the field, uh, had uh, a couple of times they uh, gave me their results. Uh, I rejected them uh, on the grounds that they were much too good, uh, admonished them that there's always an inclination to please a new boss, uh, and I didn't want them to do that. I wanted them to bend over backwards, to be fair in the study, go where the numbers took them. Uh, and... They still came up with the results you'll hear, so I brought in a team of experts from the outside, including the editor of uh, The Lancet, uh, various other uh, uh, people who have been critical of work generally, like Chris Murray uh, in, uh, uh, in Seattle, uh, and they all, uh, and plus practitioners like Paul Farmer and Helene Gale and others, uh, and they all said, uh, this is terrific. 
Uh, we had a briefing this morning at the World Bank, which went very well. Uh, editorial in the New York Times uh, supporting this. The Lancet has run an editorial supporting it. There's going to be a series of articles in the Lancet on this. In other words, to my huge relief, frankly, uh, it turned out that the uh, numbers support the conclusion that, uh, yes, it is more cost-effective to do the right thing. Uh, and how often in life does that happen? Uh, very seldom. Uh, it is more cost-effective to do the right thing, uh, which we were going to do in any case. Uh, but I think you'll be interested in the results of the study. Let me just emphasize uh, one other point about it. And that is that this is about health. But the same applies to education, protection of children, uh, et cetera, et cetera, for a lot of different reasons I won't uh, run through. And we need integrated strategies in these areas if they're going to succeed. It just stands to region, reason that if you're intervening on health, uh, but you're not coming in with education, especially for education for girls and, the, and uh, those living with disabilities, then you're not going to lift communities out of poverty and you're going to have to keep going back uh, on the health side. Uh, so you need integrated strategies, and that means that all of us, not just UNICEF, uh, have to work together. Uh, and I've been saying recently, I'll be very disappointed if this is thought of as a UNICEF strategy uh, a year or two from now, because uh, I think the facts suggest that this should be a more common strategy and all of us working uh, together. So, uh, Mickey, if I could turn it over to you. Thank you. So I'm just going to fairly rapidly take you through um, something that, like, like uh, Mr. Lake said, took us about six months of, of a lot of data crunching. It seemed like six. It was four. <laughs> um, well, it was actually, yeah. Um, and, uh, and just and give you the hypothesis and the modeling and so forth, and then leave enough time for questions and comments and, 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 and so forth. Uh, as, uh, uh, as Mr. Lake said, uh, one of the, f the startling findings, which many of us uh, in the room were also previously aware of, but actually we now have very clear indication that, in particular, if you look at the 16, uh, sorry, 24 countries which have made the most progress in reduction of under five mortality, 16 of them have actually done it with increasing disparities between the poorest and the richest. And in the majority of those countries, there's actually been a more than 10% widening of, uh, of inequalities in terms of child survival. We can show the same for nutritional status. We can show the same for um, access to critical services. And it's something which um, many of us who have been working in the field will know this, that, and we have data as well, that investing in, these, uh, in health and, and nutrition uh, um, has quite often been captured by um, the urban elites and, and the middle classes and, 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 and the better off in many of these countries. And they have soaked up and, and had multiple interventions, whereas a, a, a sizable proportion of the population are being left further and further behind. So it was a moment of pause to say, well, if we continue on this path, we may statistically in some places, and most places probably not even that, reach the MDGs. But as Mr. Lake put it, it would have been a moral failure because we would be left with the poorest, um, fur left further behind in, 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 in not much better situation than they were when we started this whole endeavor. And how much more difficult will it be to get the momentum and the movement again going on this area? So clear diagnosis there in terms of increasing inequity, largely and significantly linked to uh, access of critical interventions. And on the other hand, we do have some examples of countries which have improved, but also done it in an equitable manner. And, uh, what are, and so, so there are, you know, it's not as though this is an inevitable path and price that you pay for progress. So as uh, Mr. Lay put it, the, the challenge was, uh, the conventional wisdom was that the reason why countries have gone down this path is that it is much more cheaper and cost effective to reach those who are within reach of the roads, within reach of where health workers want to go, and let's at least maximize those returns, and then we'll slowly sort of get out and, and reach those who are more difficult as we, as we make the gains, early gains that we can. However, not only epidemiologically does that may not make sense, because you know, as you add more and more interventions to groups who already got the basics, you get less and less return for that investment, but also new innovation, new ways of delivering services, 
work that many of you in this room have really pioneered in terms of you know, ranging from, from community-based treatment through to newborn care, through to new delivery mechanisms and accountability mechanisms using technology, you know, mobile technology and so forth, meant that the cost of delivering critical interventions may have actually been reduced. Um, and we now have a reasonably good evidence base for these kinds of interventions. So putting that together, it wasn't completely um, um, fantasy, if you like, to think that doing the right thing was also the cost-effective way of doing it. And the challenge really was, well, can we empirically, with real data, uh, show this to be the case? And, and, and whether we have now reached that tipping point uh, where it is more cost-effective. So I just want to give you a quick uh, run-through of how we'd, we'd, we'd tackle this challenge. One of the first things we did is we looked at the different patterns of inequalities that you see, um, and, and once again, this is fairly well established, and I won't go through a lot of detail, but we sort of established four sort of key patterns, if, um, and it's ranging from what we're calling typology A, which is familiar to many of you, especially from West and East Africa and Central Africa, uh, where the large majority of the population are actually quite deprived, have higher rates of mortality, and something which we're calling a coverage deficit, which means basically not having access to basic services. Uh, and on the other hand, you have what we call type C countries, where sort of mostly middle, lower middle income countries, where a large, the majority of the population have uh, made the gains, but there are large pockets uh, and sizable populations who have been left behind, either because of um, political, racial, ethnic, or geographical uh, reasons. And then you have sort of uh, linear patterns um, at different levels of, of, of coverage. So we selected uh, sort of examples of each of these patterns and countries which had robust and good quality data that we could use at a dis and, 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 was, and we could disaggregate as well. One thing I want to make clear is that we then were trying to model different scenarios of how to deliver, promote, and finance the implementation of a core packages of services. So we did not try, we did not say, well, an equity-based approach will have these really cost-effective interventions and a non-equity one will have these really expensive types of interventions, you know, intensive care units and so forth. What we said is that through all these Lancet series, we have 25, 30 critical interventions ranging from vaccination through to micronutrients and through to um, treatments, um, simple treatments uh, of the biggest killers of children across the world. And so the challenge is not so much now what, you know, which intervention should we have and which ones we shouldn't have, but it's how do we get those to the poorest? And that's what we are evaluating uh, here in this study. So it really was about how does one package, uh, how does one package and deliver and finance uh, and promote these, these core interventions um, and, and modeling different approaches to do that. I'm going to jump straight to the results um, because I know that's what you're waiting for and then I'll go backwards to explain how we got to the results. And so just to show you a couple of graphics uh, of some of the key results and they're in your, um, in your short uh, um, summary report uh, um, uh, there as well. Um, calling narrowing the gaps. But you'll see from here that uh, what we found is that we, we basically modeled two different strategies, something called a current strategy and an equity-focused one. And I'll go into details of what they consist of, but just to, to briefly summarize, the current uh, was the base, the current dominant equity strategies that we have, that countries have in their plans. And we assumed that they would implement those strategies, including, for example, getting rid of user fees, of scaling up training of health workers, of getting uh, more clinics built, more nurses and doctors and so forth. And you can see that if that gets implemented in the way which uh, plans of, uh, for countries have said, there will be a, a notable de uh, decrease in the five years that we modeled to 2015 in the yellow bars, both in the most deprived and least deprived areas by doing this. But what we're calling a more equity-focused approach will get you an even greater return and it will accelerate further and give you um, uh, lower rates of mortality in both the most deprived and even in the least deprived areas as well. In other words, if we put this in terms of the 15 countries that we model and you aggregate them, uh, having an even greater focus on equities uh, and, and focusing on, on populations with the highest burdens uh, will actually accelerate progress uh, towards the MDGs. We won't reach it, 
And, and across these 15 countries, if we carry or if we actually implement the existing current uh, equity strategies, we probably won't reach uh, the MDGs. Not only that, but our analysis also found that uh, it's much more cost effective in, the, in, in all the settings. And it's, it's most cost effective in the poorest settings, in particular across Africa. So if you look at the top two graphics, with the additional million dollars invested in a more focused equity strategy, you will save up to 60, 70 percent more lives in the poorest countries because you get much better return uh, for those interventions and those ways of delivering. So very promising and very encouraging results. And let me just now take you through how we got to those results. So the first task was really to define what a more focused equity strategy should consist of. And here we um, really did an ex extensive review of the literature. We spoke to, to, to colleagues like yourself about what, what has worked for reaching the poor, uh, looked at large-scale implementation of programs which have been evaluated and shown to increase uh, coverage and improve outcomes for the poor in particular, and really built on the, the previous experiences in literature and, and the principles that we have from the Alma Ata Declaration, for example. And to summarize um, what a more pro-equity focused approach would consist of, you can put them into three main domains, if you like. One is different ways of delivering those services, um, of in particular changing the way and increasing the cost effectiveness of, and, and decreasing the cost of delivering critical services. You know, the, main, the obvious one, uh, which we have in examples, and large scale examples now of, is the training of community-based workers for diagnosing and treating malaria, pneumonia, and diarrhea, the biggest killers of children. And so the, you know, the, the development of new diagnostic technology, as well as simple training algorithms, allow us to do that very safely now uh, at the community level. But it's also about innovations of improving, um, providing um, services for newborn care, as well as uh, we've got new evidence of how to retain and better get performance from health workers in peripheral um, settings. The second domain was around being more innovative around reducing and overcoming financial barriers for the poor. And, and you know, the most obvious one um, uh, at this moment being the, the use of conditional cash transfers, as we're seeing in India, for delivery in health centers. Um, there are a number of other innovations out there which have also shown to improve uh, and get over some of the key barriers that the poor face, the financial barriers that they face. And so uh, we modeled um, some of the impacts of that um, in different settings. And a third area, which I think is quite often understated, uh, not in this audience, but in, in many of the more technical and the more medical audiences, which is the role and the importance not just of the supply side in terms of you know, health workers and vaccines and so forth, but also about empowering uh, communities and women in particular to, uh, know, to know when to get services, to know how, you know, the expectation, the accountability of services that they should be getting, um, and key behaviors in the home and, and, and between the, you know, the mother and the child in particular, which we know can have a huge impact. So we modeled and we gathered the evidence for some critical face-to-face, um, -face, you know, investing in community-based face-to-face um, education and, and empowerment strategies, women's groups, and so forth. So we collected the data on the costing of those kinds of interventions and put those in. Now, we, we also had a, two other layers of um, modeling and sophistication, if you like. One was the recognition that there is, in all settings, a unique blend of demand side and supply side barriers that the poor face. And that if you put in a, a strategy, for example, of getting rid of user fees, that will only you know, it's only be good enough if a person actually lives within, you know, distance, reasonable distance of a facility uh, to, to get to use it. So removing user fees will only give you an impact as good as the access, uh, physical access that somebody has. And, and similarly, if you take that analogy further, it'll only be as good as whether that physical facility has a trained health worker with drugs. So for each of the 15 countries, we disaggregated their House, their national survey data as well as their administrative data and we went through with the countries and with the ministries to actually validate uh, as much of this data as we could. Um, but most of the data was using household surveys and national facility surveys. Um, 
we, we sort of got these p different types of patterns. Here's an example of skilled birth attendants in Bangladesh, just to give you a sense of it. And you can see that the poor, this is for the poorest in Bangladesh, the poorest districts in Bangladesh, that they face both supply side bottlenecks, um, but even, even uh, you know, only about half the population have actual physical access to a facility uh, um, with, with um, a skilled worker. But even then, they also face some critical um, utilization demand side barriers, uh, which further reduce the effectiveness of, of the intervention of having a skilled birth attendant. So in our modeling, we basically had to model in multiple interventions to see, well, what can increase the supply uh, and what will then increase the demand side as well. The third sort of area and, 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 and um, modeling phase, if you like, was to take into account the different causes and rates of death between the poor and rich. And you're all familiar with, with this. And just to give you uh, an example here from Nigeria, where on the left-hand side, the Q1 is the poorest and Q5 is the richest, that not only uh, you will notice that there's far higher rates of mortality amongst the poorest, but I want you to pay particular attention to the causes. And as, as is uh, intuitive, but we have now modeling, and we have some data to, to show this across the countries, that the poorest families and children die of diseases and illnesses, which are the most amenable to our interventions that we have, the most cost-effective interventions. So in this case, you'll notice that malaria, pneumonia, and diarrhea cause the bulk of the mortality in the poorest quintiles in Nigeria, uh, whereas in the richest, uh, it's much more newborn, uh, congenital, browning, road traffic accidents, things which require much more sophisticated and more expensive interventions. So in modeling, we must also take into account the different cause and rates of mortality between the rich and poor and the different numbers of deaths in the rich and poor. So it's putting all that together that we came up with, the, with this cost effectiveness. It was really linking the strategies and the evidence base we have of new ways of delivering, of overcoming demand and supply side barriers, putting them into real life data from countries, uh, modeling in terms of the different causes and rates of death amongst the poor and the rich, and then um, costing it in terms of the number of life saves and the, and the extra costs spent. And this is how um, once again, I'll, I'll bring you back to, to perhaps one of the key findings around the, the extra lives saved with, with the additional funding and a more equity-focused and equity-based strategy. Um, I'm not sure how this slide slipped in. Uh, <laughs> this is just, well, maybe it's a good thing. It just gives you, and there's a look of shock on the <laughs> um, Luckily, it's accurate. <laughs> Um, but basically, it's try this is sort of this is our own sort of, and we're sort of thinking as we're running, as it were. And what does this mean in terms of our own um, priorities? I think the first point to make is that it really is, um, and we've had questions in the World Bank, for example, how is this different from our human rights-based approach and what we've done previously? And it's not different, but what it what it is different about it, in in, in, in if there is a difference is that it's a much greater focus on data, a much greater focus on doing detailed situational assessments of what are the barriers that the poor are facing. It's paying much greater attention to the evidence of what has worked and what hasn't worked. So it's trying to shift the organization as a whole to be much more rigorous and much more take much more advantage on the huge investments that we make on household surveys, on data collection uh, at the country level. And then I think it's also focusing us much more on the collaboration and the partnerships uh, aspect to scale up uh, innovations, some of which are our own innovations, many of them are not our innovations, but it really is trying to get the organization as a whole to, to focus on partnering, particularly at the country level, and we've been talking to many of you about how to do that better, uh, to really scale up some of these innovations that we know have worked and are working uh, and taking them to new places and learning by doing. So this is part of you know, a big reason why we're, we're here today, really, is about how to make this not just our agenda, but your agenda, um, partner with you as well on this. Thank you. If, if I could emphasize or uh, make uh, just uh, three points. One is that the actual modeling of taking the two uh, strategies 
uh, which I would emphasize were models, not actual strategies uh, that we'll be pursuing. I'll come back to that. But in taking the two model strategies and running them through the four typologies, uh, and Mickey and Rudy are remarkably sane for having uh, worked on this, uh, there were over 180,000 different data points that they had to take account of as they ran the, and, and this was a massive modeling uh, effort, uh, again, in consultation with some of the world's leading uh, methodologists on all of this. Uh, and I just want to emphasize uh, one of the uh, points on the uh, MBB analyses of looking at bottlenecks. Uh, as you notice, the supply side uh, it, we're doing better uh, than the demand side. Uh, and just as I hope that this study helps us re adjust our thinking a little bit on the conventional wisdom that it's too expensive to do this, because it turns out to be more cost effective to do it. Another is that uh, certainly for me, to the degree I've been a part of the development community, and certainly now, my conventional wisdom has been that aid is all about supply. Uh, more vaccines, more bed nets, more of this, uh, more of that. But what this shows, and it's a very important conclusion, is that we have to focus a lot more on the demand side of helping the poor have access to this, lowering fees, changing behaviors and things as simple as hand washing or convincing mothers if you provide waiting houses, for example, to go so that they can take advantage of clinics that are closer to it, uh, uh, to, to their villages, and uh, that <clears throat> it has implications for how we think about developing health systems. Uh, because the tradition has been, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Mickey, uh, I'm a political scientist, doctor, not a, you know, uh, that uh, the tradition has been that you start with the hospitals in the city, where not coincidentally the, the daughters and sons of ministers can get their kids to, government ministers can get their kids to a hospital, uh, and then out to the higher tech clinics, and then to the lower tech clinics, and then finally out into the communities. Uh, and what this suggests is that it is more cost effective to s concentrate uh, on the communities and also build back in your healthcare systems to the higher tech uh, coming out. I would emphasize here, we are not calling for stopping what we're doing now in building healthcare systems. Uh, you will not find me going to some country and saying, tear down that hospital, Mr. Gorbachev. Uh, uh, but we are saying on all of this that as we go forward uh, in our marginal work uh, going forward for the next five years and beyond, uh, we need to put more resources into this uh, and less into the uh, traditional approaches. <clears throat> And finally, for since we have the what does it mean for UNICEF, uh, I want to emphasize that uh, what we're doing right now uh, is every one of our country offices around the world, uh, under the direction of our regional offices, are uh, re-examining their programs to and look at them through the prism uh, of equity so that we don't stop everything that we're doing now, but we are shifting our resources uh, over the coming year or two uh, more into the strategies so that we're building the UNICEF strategy from the bottom up as an amalgamation of all the different country strategies uh, because they're all, uh, as we all know, different, uh, rather than a diktat from New York saying here is the new religion and you will follow it uh, in a certain uh, detail. Uh, this is going to take a little while and that is why we we're working on it so urgently. Uh, because it is A, going to take a while to shift, and B, uh, then uh, take a while to uh, get the results. And all of this, I would emphasize, all of it is about results. This is not about theory. It is about what actually happens in the lives of the children uh, and of women uh, and of everybody uh, around the world. We would welcome questions and even better comments from which we can learn. Let me thank you both for the, the great um, presentations. And uh, let me say, when I was reading through the, this document, which is really quite a phenomenal document if people haven't had the chance to look at it yet, um, I was also struck by the 180,000 data point figure last night. And it was giving me quite a headache, actually, trying to even get my mind around what that might mean in terms of the type of analysis that you're doing. But 
a couple of different streams that I, I might just try to um, bring together in, in one initial question to get us started is um, I was struck by a couple of things you both said. Um, the first is that you don't just want this to be UNICEF's approach. You really want this to become a common platform that more globally the, the community adopts. Um, the second is the focus on shifting the demand side of the equation, which clearly has been a stumbling block for, for quite a while. Um, but the third point I come back to is a, a speaker we had here not too long ago, and I think a number of folks in the room with us today were here last month when we had the Afghan Minister of Health, Soraya Delil, with us, who I believe is a former UNICEF staff member herself. Um, and she's clearly a woman of great vision and purpose, um, but has an enormously difficult job. And you know, she laid out some of the progress that's been made, particularly on the child health agenda. Maternal health still seems to be quite stubborn. But you know, as I was thinking about your presentation just now, I was thinking, what, what does this type of approach practically mean to her? And Afghanistan, of course, is an extreme case. And I know you don't even have it included in your data summaries because there isn't enough data to be able to do that. But when you look at the countries where the inequities are the greatest, places that very often are conflicted countries, how is it, do you think, you can go about moving this approach forward? And what are you going to need from others? What are you going to need from the other multilateral partners, bilateral partners, development partners, host governments, in order to be able to actually make this, make this work? Sure. Um, and I think your first comment, in many ways, also started to address the second one, in terms of what we're um, what we think, and we, and as, as you saw from the last slide, it's helping us to really focus our, our country offices and our own organization and in, in, in the way in which we give support to governments and, and civil society in these countries to really ask the hard questions as to who are being left out, where are they, and then also try and interrogate as much of the data. But, and sometimes it also means in addition, not sometimes, but it always means in addition talking to the people who work and live out in these areas about what are the critical barriers in terms of supply and demand. But then also bringing to bear on that problem the latest innovation and examples we have of success. And even a country like Afghanistan, as, as the minister I'm sure shared with you, have some real innovations in terms of their contracting out of critical services, of, um, you know, even, even, I mean, the polio program there has reached 99% of children, uh, even in a country like that. So to show that even in, the, in some of the most desperate circumstances, there are examples of where we have succeeded in reaching the poorest. And, and, the, and, the, and so it, is, it really is about working from the ground up, taking the perspective of the poorest child and saying, okay, what is the barrier that she is facing in getting you know, survival interventions and then education and development interventions, and how can we bring the best evidence that we have and the experience we have globally but also locally onto that problem? If I could add into this, uh, obviously the hardest place to do this uh, is in countries in conflict uh, or fragile states uh, on either side, but we can't let that deter us. We have to think hard uh, about how to do it. Uh, and one question is advocacy here uh, with governments, and we hope, because in the end it's governments, uh, no matter how well we do, NGOs do, and others, it's governments that can take things to scale and that can make the decisions on school fees, uh, on uh, health uh, systems, uh, health fees, et cetera. Uh, and we hope that this report uh, will help us uh, be advocates with governments, pointing out to them, including finance ministries, uh, who are the key barrier in most of this, uh, they speak this language. And if we can speak the language of cost effectiveness uh, and uh, working for results, then we're speaking the language uh, that can get to, can help our friends in these governments, uh, in the health ministries, et cetera, uh, make the case with the politi more political leadership and uh, uh, with the finance ministries and others. And we can be better advocates the more uh, we are all doing it together. Uh, rather than UNICEF, obviously, uh, alone. And I was very encouraged uh, by our conversations with the World Bank uh, this morning where we found a lot of areas that we can now work together going forward. Uh, the second point is something we haven't touched on at all, of how do you operate in an Afghanistan or a Somalia or elsewhere. 
Uh, and uh, let me simply share a concern that I have that I know Sam, uh, I believe Sam shares. You can uh, disagree. Um, and I will go into shock. Uh, uh, and that is, uh, well, I began uh, when I was at a uh, polio event, in uh, anti-polio event uh, in uh, Geneva. Uh, and at the airport, I uh, was waiting, of course, for United Airlines, whoever it was, uh, and had a chance to have a long talk with one of the workers on polio in Afghanistan, uh, asking, how do you do it uh, in uh, Taliban areas? Uh, and by the way, I think the last holdout on this tremendously important campaign against polio will be along the Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, Tajikistan, et cetera, uh, borders. But um, how do you do it? And he was saying, well, uh, we can work in these areas uh, because uh, while UNICEF may not be popular, uh, the Taliban in those areas know that the communities want to see these interventions, whether it's against polio or in other areas, and the Taliban doesn't want to be unpopular, so they're letting us do it. Or I could use the example of a water treatment plant south of Mogadishu, uh, which we had begun uh, in a town south of Mogadishu before the Taliban, uh, before the uh, uh, Shabab came in. Uh, and the Shabab tried to shut it down, and the people there said, no, we want our water. So they're allowing us to continue to do it. The problem is that we are, can do this to the degree that we and NGOs and others are perceived to be not neutral, but non-political. And the danger is that in conflict situations, there, are, there is an impulse to, because we are popular, as I was just saying, to use our popularity for political purposes uh, and to integrate missions in ways that make everything that we are doing a part of the political and military effort uh, in these uh, countries. Uh, and we are resisting this in every way reasonably that we can. I know that the uh, SAM, the NGO community, is uh, very concerned about this and very usefully concerned about it uh, as well. And I simply wanted to mention that because we are in, I believe, Washington, D.C., uh, where some of those impulses uh, may reside. Uh, so uh, I just think it's tremendously important uh, that we keep all this in those areas as nonpolitical uh, as possible, or we are not going to be able to help those uh, children and, and women and others who are uh, most in need. Let's take some questions from um, our guests, and what we'll do is we'll do them maybe groups of three, and just please identify yourself when I call on you. So, Anne, please. Mm -hmm. Hi, Anne Richard, International Rescue Committee. I think what's um, really great about the presentation is this... Um, Could we stop right there? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Is that it... Um, is showing, you know, quantitatively the impact this can have, uh, this approach can have, and the time in Washington could not be better for that because, you know, in every meeting we have with the new USAID administrator, you know, he really is focused on metrics and benchmarks and measurable um, approaches, and I suspect that if it's going to get tougher and tougher making the case for um, aid to Congress in the months ahead, as is predicted, this type of evidence will be the thing that gets the most traction. So you're, I think your timing could not, could not be better. At the same time, we're hearing more coming out of the administration about um, uh, investing aid in a way, and what, it, what they're really saying is so that it's not wasted, which means um, you know, trying to do it in a way that avoids risk and goes to best performing countries the way the Millennium Challenge Corporation does and uh, rewards, uh, you know, good performing countries. And it, they speak, and the, the terminology about this tends to be very bilaterally focused and also working in places where, uh, where you get a good investment. They're also saying where you get the greatest impact, so that potentially leaves the door open to uh, getting to uh, countries where perhaps they have lousy governments but the people really need the aid. Um, so have you all 
given some reflection to how this fits into the new administration's development policy that is, as, as I've described it, or the, the pieces that I'm picking up on. Gentleman right in the middle. Hi, uh, Tim Shriver with Special Olympics. I uh, echo the comments. I think this is such an extraordinarily exciting uh, direction. And, uh, and I, I guess I just have a couple of sort of loosely strung together questions. Um, and it comes from our experience in trying to provide health care in addition to recreation and educational opportunities for people with intellectual disabilities. Um, the, the thing we see the most frequently in this subpopulation, this small subpopulation, the f most frequent barrier to effective delivery of any kind of health care service is stigma. It's social, cultural, uh, interpersonal uh, stigma, bias, uh, devaluation. Uh, and it plays out in many, many ways. It plays out in the undertraining of health care professionals to treat specific syndromes or specific disabilities. It plays out in the devaluation of parents who have children uh, with special needs, which leads them to be less likely to bring their children out in public or access services or even admit to having a child at all in certain situations. Um, and it leads to sort of this large-scale kind of elephant in the room, if you will, uh, that's not really about supply, if you, in a way, Tony, or even about demand. It's about the interaction between the two. It's about the relationship between supply and demand. And it's not a good one. <laughs> the demand is there, the supply is there, but they don't talk the same language. So it's a long way of saying, you know, the idea of community empowerment, community engagement, I think is right, dead on. And the question I guess I have is, as you begin to think about that, are you thinking that there are potential significant paradigm shifts in the way in which you do your work, the kind of work you're going to have to do, the kind of partners? I mean, one of the challenges we face, you know, we do 100,000 health screenings a year, and there's not hardly any development organization that will give us a dime to do them. That's mostly our fault. We haven't told the story properly. But part of it is just the sort of sense in which you're a non-traditional partner. You don't really have a lot of MDs on your your letterhead, you don't really do this, do you? Uh, so, and I'm not, I'm not looking for support, I guess I'm just trying to flag the complexity of attacking the biases inherent in cultures, whether it's on disability or ethnicity or race or gender, uh, and the need for dedicated strategies to attack that piece of the barrier if we're going to get to really the hardest to reach, because the hardest to reach in, my, in our experience aren't just the poorest, they're the people that have been most socially marginalized, at, and often quite deliberately so. And then let's take one more question, Seth, at the same table there, the lady with the arm up. Thanks very much. Rachel Nugent, Center for Global Development, and congratulations on the new post and the very exciting report. This uh, seems like it could be quite a watershed. And uh, so I want to ask you, Go, go back up to New York and shift the focus there and ask you about the, re the relationships with your UN uh, brethren and sisteren or <laughs> whatever, um, and how this fits into the delivering as one uh, UN, and in particular, because I think there's a, a, a nice opportunity given that you have, of course, a new partner in Michelle Bachelet and the development of UN Women and what that will become, and you will soon have a new partner at UNFPA. Uh, I don't ask this as an idle question. I have to confess we are doing an expert working group project right now on leadership transition at UNFPA and thinking very, uh, in a very focused way about uh, what that agency needs to do in its next, next incarnation. So I really appreciate what you're bringing to the table for our thinking about that. But what's your thinking about delivering as one? Uh, let me, the really interesting questions, all of them questions and challenges that we are, in fact, wrestling with uh, going forward. First, the administration uh, approach. Uh, we're taking the roadshow. We've been at the World Bank this morning. Uh, we're here now. We're going to the White House next, uh, and we'll be meeting with uh, Don Steinberg from AID, various uh, others from around the administration. And we're grateful the White House is uh, hosting this, and we hope to infect them. Uh, with this as we are hoping to infect you and uh, I believe we 
uh, uh, infected the World Bank uh, some more this morning. Um, and again, let me emphasize this, UNICEF didn't discover this. We did this study, we are going to be focusing on it, but this is, uh, we are taking advantage of a lot of accumulated work uh, by a lot of people, including in this uh, room as we uh, go uh, forward. Uh, so uh, we'll be working this. Uh, the question of the how does this relate to the MCC and the uh, best performers and all of that, uh, and a related question is does this relate to middle-income countries? Uh, and the answer is twofold. One, there, there is a great danger, and it's the path we're on now, in which with the MDGs we are looking for progress through averaging of countries. Uh, and theoretically, we could make a lot of progress towards the MDGs in a lot of areas simply through China and large parts of India. Uh, and leaving behind most of Sub-Saharan Africa, other parts of India, other great uh, swatches of the world. Uh, and that's, uh, A, not cost-effective, as we're hoping to show, uh, as we are showing, I think, and B, it's just plain wrong. Uh, so. Uh, one of our arguments on this has been to use maps from that I've been that across my desk, and I used it with our executive board, uh, maps from Brazil that are Brazilian maps, and the Brazilians have been very happy that we're uh, using it, uh, showing that if you look at Brazil on under five mortality and progress towards MDG4, uh, it's a beautiful green blob. And then if you flip the map and look at it at the state level, suddenly there are big patches of red in the semi-arid regions and elsewhere. And then if you break it down by municipalities, it's a leopard with areas of red throughout the whole country, which the Brazilian government is very aware of and is uh, working on. Uh, my point being that we can't do this through averaging, uh, and the, the uh, uh, millennium, I mean the best performers tend to be average best performers. Uh, uh, but even in those areas like Brazil or the others, in, the, uh, in Latin America as a whole, 14 of the 20 most inequitable societies are in Latin America. So there's a lot of work to do in middle-income countries uh, as well. But the bottom line is, the, if you remember from the charts, uh, in the first two uh, models uh, from Africa, if we leave them behind, uh, then shame on all of us, and we're not being cost-effective at the same time. Uh, secondly, on uh, stigma, uh, yeah, I think it is though mostly a demand side, uh, and it is where the demand then comes together with the supply, but stigmatizing is a huge barrier to this, uh, but it's one of the kinds of social patterns that we have to be addressing, and we, there are, as Mickey mentioned, uh, more effective ways of uh, addressing them. Uh, and this is not only, although it's very important, as I mentioned, for uh, children and others living with disabilities, which get stigmatized, uh, but also in the whole uh, approach to HIV and AIDS and uh, PMTCT, Prevention of Mother to Child Transmission, which we are very focused on. We're working with UNAIDS and others to, uh, for the virtual elimination of PMTCT, uh, if possible, uh, and I think it is possible by 2015, which means to get it under 5%. Um, uh, transmission, and their stigmatizing is a tremendous issue as well. And let me just describe one very, and we are concerned about this running throughout it, and let me just describe one specific example, which is that uh, in a week I'll be going to, I'll be in Kenya and we'll be going out to Kisumu to introduce something that we've been testing in I think four different uh, countries now uh, and are going to take to scale. Uh, uh, it's called Mother Baby Packs, where we uh, have uh, got a, uh, a pack of all the medicines that a mother needs uh, before, during, and after uh, childbirth to prevent uh, transmission. Uh, Color-coded, very easy to understand, and the mother, when she comes to the clinic, uh, hopefully before uh, birth, uh, then she gets this pack, uh, and then she can, with checkups from a community worker, administer to herself what would have taken uh, going repeatedly to a clinic that she probably can't reach. The problem is that how does she take the pack because she's tested positive uh, without being stigmatized? So we are finding, I think they're pails now that we're going to use, in which every mother gets a pail that she can use for clean water, uh, and in some of them the mother baby pack goes into the pail, so when she walks away 
than if she doesn't have the courage to uh, talk about it. Uh, she's not stigmatized uh, when she leaves. So uh, it's a very practical issue that we're running through a lot of uh, different uh, things. Um, with our sister agencies, and I'm glad you, uh, who was it? Sorry. Yeah, there you are back there. Um, um, and I'm glad you used the word sister, because I am proud to say that Thuraya, uh, who runs UNFPA, Margaret Chan at WHO, et cetera, as it happened in the uh, H4, I guess it was, uh, uh, all of them before I arrived were women, and they were all calling uh, themselves the, uh, the sisters. Uh, and Margaret, I thought rather offensively, uh, said to me, so what do we call ourselves now? Is it the sisters and the boy? And I, uh, I said no, <laughs> uh, that uh, gender abuse can go in each direction, and I, uh, um, but that uh, I would be honored if they would uh, call me their honorary sister. Uh, so Margaret and Thurai and all of them now call me uh, uh, sister, which I'm quite proud of. It leads to some occasional uh, questioning looks when they do it in public occasions, and they don't explain why they're calling me their sister. But uh, anyway... Uh, I've been very pleased at how this notion is uh, getting some traction with the others. Uh, so, for example, we've been talking to UNDP uh, now in various ways about how uh, we can integrate it into uh, the, uh, through resident coordinators, uh, into, again, a more integrated uh, uh, approach from all of the agencies. But uh, I think it's not good enough for it to be simply among, within the UN, reform system, but we need it with NGOs, uh, with uh, bilateral uh, aid programs, and especially then with uh, governments. Uh, so, uh, uh, so far, so good. It's been uh, just a couple of months. Uh, the MDG Summit was very useful uh, in spreading this. Uh, I'm trying to resist, again, becoming like a religious zealot and going out in the street and grabbing people by the lapels and saying, have you thought about equity? It's cost effective, et cetera. But uh, uh, since it is a practical message, I think we are making progress with them, and I'm, I'm pleased with it so far, but that is the strategic objective. Let's take Mickey, a few. Wanna... Sorry. Let's take a few other questions. David, please. Mm -hmm. Uh, David Oot, uh, Head of Health and Nutrition at Save the Children at Yin. I think, as you know, we're very committed to this issue and, in fact, very pleased to see this not new in a way, but renewed commitment on the part of UNICEF to addressing the issue of equity. And if I could intervene, yes. uh, we were certainly drawing on Save the Children's work, and I wanted to make the point I was just making about uh, playing well with others as we move forward on this mission. So we announced this at joint press conferences in London and in New York with Save the Children. Yes. And thank you. And we were very appreciative of that. I, I, what I wanted to say, however, is that I think this analysis is a, a very useful contribution. It's going to be enormously helpful to us and others, I think, in helping to make the case that we need to focus more attention on this issue. The challenge that we've faced over the years, uh, even though we've had relatively good, not as good as this, documentation of what, what's working well or not so well is translating that into action. So practical guidance and tools that can actually be used by our organization and our counterparts to, first of all, develop strategies and plans that in fact do more systematically take this into effect, but interestingly enough, develop and use the metrics so that we actually know what kind of progress we're making, whether or not we're achieving those results. It's surprising. Uh, we had Dave Guatkin come and spend some time with us a few months ago, and he embarrassed us all by demonstrating that we really didn't have a lot of data to actually document uh, how well or not so well we were doing in this regard. So that's really important from our perspective. Um, and there are some draft tools and guidance that I just mentioned to Mickey earlier are in the process of being developed. Uh, the second is that I very much agree uh, about the importance of the demand side. It's often ignored or given much less attention, but I actually don't want us to forget about the supply side, uh, yeah. both in terms of having trained and skilled staff in place where they need to be, community level, first level facilities, and with the drugs they need to do the job, and I'm, this is 
top of mind right now because right this minute in Mali, we have a large scale program in what's called community case management of malaria, pneumonia, and diarrhea that can't be implemented because those drugs are in fact not available. So we, we do need to continue to work on both ends of this. Let's take two more brief questions, if we can. Please, Sam. Hi. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Sam Worthington from Interaction, and uh, appreciate your comments. And I think you're, you're just your broader statement that the uh, in conflict environments, that the space to improve human well-being that is not politicized is shrinking. Um, and that is a challenge that we face in our ability to do our work, I think, as a whole community. Um, more broadly, the ability to engage at the community level, uh, create demand, link that up with supply, uh, try to overcome stigma, uh, link those frontline capacities of governments, of communities, is a, is a space to some extent the NGO community has filled. It's a space that UNICEF has engaged with. The challenge we face is how does this relate to the broader concept of, of country ownership um, and the accusations that we sometimes get as if you've been able to reduce these uh, significantly changed indicators and performance and so forth, but they're not sustainable because they have bypassed the state. And there tends to be the implication that the state has to be down from the top and the building the systems that way rather than this. In essence, what I see is, is a broader definition of country ownership uh, that involves uh, demand from the community. And I don't know if you could address that because I think it, it will play into uh, broader uh, dialogues in this town on, uh, on aid reform. And one more question, the gentleman in the back here. Hi, I'm John Fawcett with Results. Um, this is really exciting because as you mentioned, it's, it's sort of nice when your values match up with cost effectiveness data, which certainly isn't always the case in our, in our field of work. So. Um, I imagine that you will or have already found a, a paradox where uh, the study talks about a current approach and a equity approach uh, being distinct things and probably when you talk about this with people they say, oh, we're already doing that. So uh, I guess my question is, um, can you talk, and I saw a little bit of it, but is it, you know, is it geographical? Is it in the types of interventions? Is it the way you do them? Maybe as specifically as possible just in a couple of examples how would an equity approach differ from what's currently sort of standard operating procedure? That's all that, uh, all that matters is action. Uh, and that's why we're emphasizing working at the, commu at the country level uh, rather than at the more theoretical levels and how to uh, proceed here uh, to uh, turn it into action is, of course, a big managerial issue. Uh, it involves very hard work, sometimes not dramatic or romantic work, uh, every day. Uh, but uh, that's what we're going to do uh, because the goal here is so important. Uh, and one of the ways we're going to do it is by forming uh, teams that can go to our regional and country offices who can help, especially in the 60 countries from which we got this data uh, that Mickey and uh, Rudy are going to be uh, forming that can go then to the country level and say, here's the data we've already got, here's the analysis we did in the uh, process of doing this report, here's how it can help you now program uh, with a greater attention to equity. And Mickey will in a minute address this, the paradox uh, when people, including our own country offices, say, but we're already doing it. Uh, and of course, in many ways, we are doing it. Uh, but it's a, it's in essence, it's the same interventions in a different mix and with different uh, uh, priorities, uh, and and uh, 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 both in terms of geography and in the kinds of uh, interventions or the uh, the emphasis on certain interventions rather than others. Uh, but let me come back to the point. Uh, first of all, on results, how do we get the metrics? Uh, to examine the results so that we can make uh, the case. Uh, and this is very hard, uh, in truth. It begins, I just met with all of our, uh, not all of them, but uh, with uh, dozens of our folks from around the world uh, who are doing uh, monitoring and evaluation uh, planning. Uh, and uh, what I was emphasizing is that, and I learned a lot 
by the way, from them. And I don't mean to be implying here that I am a world authority on all of this because I've been here uh, in the job five months and I'm still learning, but some things pop out at me. Uh, and one is that there's a great danger, there are a couple of great dangers here. I think one is that uh, our folks can look on results-based planning and therefore the ability to, including metrics, to the degree possible, uh, and then uh, the monitoring and the evaluation as laborious boxes to fill out uh, for headquarters. And we need to emphasize this is a way of thinking, that if we are passionate about this mission, then it's all that matters is results. Therefore, let us plan for results and then set up the metrics. There's a danger here, however, uh, and that is that because uh, these are hard financial times, uh, and because our donors need to uh, make the case to legislatures and to finance ministries, et cetera, that this is uh, achieving results. There's a great temptation to cheat or to get twisted by this. Uh, you can get twisted by it because then you're going to start looking for simple programs that have simple results uh, so that we can show the donors to give us more money. Uh, and so you can get twisted uh, towards simplicity and what are inherently complex uh, questions. Uh, and secondly, you can cheat by, uh, well, let me back up. There's a, a real paradox here in which we are under a lot of pressure, as we should be, for UN reform, for working well together, for all of us integrated approaches. We're all working together on the one hand and from donors saying, so what specific results did you, UNICEF, achieve uh, from the money we gave you? Uh, and we could cheat by saying uh, everything that's been achieved in this community is because UNICEF was a part of it, even if we had very little to do with it. Uh, I don't want to overstate this point, but I think most of us will recognize in this room, and I think we need, at least from our point of view at UNICEF, to stop uh, in any way doing this uh, in implying that we have sole uh, uh, sponsor, uh, credit for uh, these results because if you totaled, in my view, uh, for all the results that are claimed by all of the bilateral aid programs and all of the NGOs and all of the UN agencies, we have saved, by my just instant calculation, something like 140 billion children over the last year. Uh, so we need to go back to the donors and say, let's be realistic about this, uh, that not all the results we can achieve are quantitative. Some of them are qualitative, especially as we do more and more advocacy. Uh, it could be that a government has made a decision to remove uh, school fees. Uh, yes, because we advocated, but maybe f because it was good policy, maybe because the education minister was more powerful, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to get the donors to be more realistic also and point out to them that, by the way, in their bilateral aid programs, maybe they can't trace these things exactly perfectly uh, either while working as hard as we can to uh, do this. Um, and to come back to the point about uh, humanitarian space uh, and how does that relate to governments. Well, your point is a very, I think, a wise one, which is that if you define government as including more local officials, et cetera, with whom we have to work, uh, we are doing that. Uh, uh, but I think the other point, and I want to be careful in how I, I make this point, uh, is that we need to uh, show both governments and their support the governments who support them, whether it's in Afghanistan or Pakistan or Somalia or wherever, that these uh, issues, Sudan, uh, where I predict it's going to get a whole lot more difficult over the coming months. Uh, and we need to be planning for that, uh, parenthetically. Uh, that in fact, by allowing the non-political folks to be working in these areas, it's good for those governments. Uh, because uh, everybody is getting some credit for this progress, and the progress itself is important for those governments. So paradoxically, when governments try to politicize what they are doing, uh, they are damaging themselves, uh, even if the political impact is not immediate, uh, because then these areas are going to get worse and worse, uh, and because... Uh, uh, even if the association is not direct, uh, what we're doing is good for their standing in a more general way. And the reason I wanted to be careful in how I phrase that is we must never 
though, say that the reason we're doing this is in order to make those governments uh, look good, uh, because it's not. Uh, the reason we're doing it is for the results uh, for the children and the women and the populations in those areas. You see what I'm saying? And I think they're being a bit short-sighted when they want immediate political cre credit and are therefore reducing our ability to do the things that in a much larger sense are good for everybody. Mickey, did you want to? Just to answer the final question around what was the difference between what we call in current and the more equity focused, and Rudy can chip in as well here. Um, just to make one point first, that the current, we, we didn't want to have a straw man of having a set of policies and interventions which were so regressive that almost anything would be, would get better results. So the, what we call in current did have a lot of progressive components, what, and we're based on what national governments, progressive national governments have got on their books and plans and, and, and so forth. So it included abolishment of user fees, it included scaling up quite radically training of nurses and midwives and doctors, it included building new facilities in, in, in the periphery. So, you know, we did try and model in um, within, within reasonable um, limits of, of how, uh, you know, if things went well and the, and the resources were there, how the present progressive strategies would, 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 would be implemented. And as I made in my presentation, the critical um, difference and, 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 and the different way of working in the equity focus one was really to, to have those three key shifts, if you like. One was to focus much more on this changing the service delivery mode, the, the production function, if you like, of the way in which we deliver services. So having much more focus on building from, from the outside um, and from the periphery inwards in terms of starting with community-based workers and strengthening retention of existing primary care workers and improving their training and, and so forth. Uh, working much more innovatively on the financing, uh, getting over financial barriers, the use of conditional cash transfers, the use of pooled um, um, schemes to, to, to compensate people for getting to, for drug costs and so forth. And then perhaps most importantly was we put many more resources into the communication, social mobilization, um, overcoming the stigma side of things so we you know there is some evidence based of what works whether it's in in Vietnam using um, ethnic um, people to, to be translators in the clinic for example um, um, uh, but, uh, as well as other innovations that we know have worked in improving access to the most marginalized to some of these services so uh, we did try and do it do it as fairly as we could just to make the point that um, and we can still improve on what we have and be much more. Just on this issue of, of country ownership, just very briefly, um, the other point in, in, on top of what uh, Ms. Lake has said is um, that we are now having large countries like Ethiopia, Malawi, India, Nepal, uh, Bangladesh, even, even Pakistan, where they are, governments themselves have recognized and are investing in community-based workers, health extension workers, so this is not just a, you know, an NGO or UNICEF sort of um, passion anymore. It is governments themselves are realizing this is a wise investment. And you know, where it's happening, they're seeing Im impressive results already, as you know. So um, I think we can start to, we have, you know, and as we are doing, to say this is not just a, a crazy idea from, from a group of outside, but this is something which countries themselves are, uh, and when, where they have done it, they're having really fantastic results. Closing thoughts. I'm, I'm glad you were, used the word passion because, uh, as I hope you can tell, if, at least in my own reserved New Englandish way, uh, this is uh, uh, a passionate but a rational passion. Uh, and I hope that all of you, uh, to the degree you agree with all of this, will uh, be yourselves infected with some of the rational passion uh, on this issue uh, and help uh, just spread it. Uh, because, again, it is not only right, it is practical. Uh, and if we're going to do all the things we can do, and we have a responsibility to do that, uh, then I hope all of you will help us uh, spread the word as we have to go uh, do now at the, uh, or have the opportunity to do at the uh, White House. And again, I want to thank you very much for uh, giving us this opportunity. So I'm sure you'll all join me in thanking um, Dr. Lake. And let let me say, wishing you the best on making this vision a reality and recognizing that you're at 
the start of the process. I think this is an audience that's really interested in this issue, and you know, we'd love to have you back in the future as the um, initiative unfolds to tell us more and solicit more input and support. So thanks again for joining You're us welcome. today.